Good evening, faith, family, and freedom friends. I am glad you're able to join us tonight. We are coming up on lesson number seven, if you can believe it, in our study of the book of Daniel. And I hope you're enjoying the study as much as I'm enjoying it. I'm learning so much every week. I've studied the Bible my whole life, and I'm still learning new things. So I love that. It's one of the things I love about the Bible. You can never stop learning. God always reveals something new. Um, I'm going to apologize ahead of time in case my messengers thing keeps dinging. I tried to turn it off, but I can't seem to get able to turn the sound off on this. But anyways, chapter 7, I mean, sorry, lesson 7 is chapter 5 of the book of Daniel. Now, up until this point, in chapters 1 through 4, we spend our time talking about the kingdom of King Nebuchadnezzar, who we've jovially referred to as King Neb. And we're done with King Neb. But we're not done with his ancestors. So a period of time, not totally sure how many decades have passed between where chapter 4 ended and where chapter 5 begins. But we do know from archaeological evidence and scripts and scrolls and whatnot that the current king that is in place at the beginning of chapter 5 turns out to be the grandson of King Neb. So this dude's name is King Belshazzar. Now, he's not really the true king. His father is the king, but his dad took off on a journey. Hey, Jim. And he left his son in charge. So he's actually a crowned prince sitting on the throne as the king. So King Belshazzar is running the show of <clears throat> Babylon. Now, remember, a little summary from before. Babylon was a city that was very, very powerful, but it came to power very quickly. It kind of didn't exist, and then all of a sudden, boom, there's this kingdom that's basically in charge of the whole world. And so they became very powerful very quickly. There, it was a walled city. They had lots and lots of resources, lots of people, lots of soldiers, lots of wise guys. <clears throat> but because of all that, they had lots of arrogance and pride and hubris, all different words for the same thing. So in chapter 5 of Daniel, we're going to read, we're, just, we're going to go piecemeal this week. <clears throat> just the first four verses, and we'll talk about that, and then we'll move on. <coughs> hey, Jim. <coughs> so chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Again, I'm going to be reading from the message. King Belshazzar held great feast for 1,000 nobles. <clears throat> the wine flowed freely. Belshazzar, heady with the wine, ordered that the gold and silver chalices that his father, actually his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, had stolen from God's temple of Jerusalem be brought in so that he and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines could drink from them. Now these were the chalices that had been consecrated for use in the temple in Jerusalem. So when Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to Judea, and he took Daniel and his buddies, he also took all of the items of the wealth, the, um, I'm sorry, the valuables that were in the temple. And they were these chalices made of gold and silver, or real gold and real silver. I'll take him. So King Belshazzar, in a drunken stupor, and his pride and arrogance, decides, okay, it's not enough that I'm having this huge party and that I completely, apparently have no regard for Jehovah God, but now I'm going to desecrate <clears throat> the holy chalices. So go get those, go get those special chalices and bring them. And we're going to, not only is he, are he and his nobles going to drink from them, but his wives and his concubines. Now that whole concubine thing, I still don't get how that was part of the culture there, but it was. So they did. He said, his little minions toddled off and they brought back these sacred chalices. Now, if you grew up in, well, the Catholic Church especially, the items that, that, were, that are used for Holy Communion are considered sanctified. They are set apart specifically for use in Communion. And in many of the churches, even today, they share a common chalice. So the wine is consecrated, it's prayed for, the wine or the juice, whatever, is poured into this chalice, and then from that consecrated chalice, 
the the communion is given to the parishioners. But these this item this chalice was set apart, and these guys, Belshazzar, said, "I'm going to just in your face, Jehovah God. I don't believe in you. I don't think you're anything. I'm the one who's all powerful." <clears throat> so when I was growing up, when I was a kid, and um, you wanted to dis disrespect somebody, we had this weird. I, I don't know if any remember this. We said, "In your face," and we would go like this. Face, face. We did this at football games and basketball games when we were trying to heckle the other team. I don't know why, but we went, oh, face, in your face. That's exactly what he was doing. Belshazzar was flying in the face of God by desecrating these holy and sanctified and sacred elements by filling them with his wine and just drinking at them just to say, ha, to you, God. Basically thumbing his nose at God. So, when the gold and silver chalices were brought in, the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, drank wine from them. They drank the wine and drunkenly praised their gods made of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. Now, when I read that last verse, that was verse, the end of verse 4, all I could think about was the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about. Remember that? The statue of the first dream that he had the dream and he had Daniel... He wanted everybody to tell him the dream and tell him the, the meaning of it. And in that dream, he saw a statue. The statue was gold and silver and bronze and clay. Those were the elements that this people group, the Babylonians and the Chaldeans, that's what they worshipped. They worshipped things like inanimate objects that could obviously not do anything. I mean, they were made by people. They were, you know, the elements were harvested from the ground and fashioned by people into these things. Now, this is a candle holder, but so they would make these little gods out of wood or rocks or pottery or gold or silver or bronze. And that's who these Babylonians, King Belshazzar and his buddies, that's who they were praising using the sacred chalices from the temple from Judea. Yikes. Just the audacity. <clears throat> and now, verse 5, at that very moment, so as soon as they started drinking the wine from those and praising their ridiculous, stupid gods, at that very moment, the fingers of a human hand appeared. This is verse 5 and began writing on the lamp-illumined, whitewashed wall of the palace, actually carving letters into the wall. <clears throat> now, when the king saw the disembodied hand writing away, he went white as a ghost, scared out of his wits. His legs went limp and his knees knocked. He yelled out for the enchanters, the fortune tellers, and the diviners to come, the wise guys. He told these Babylonian magi, Anyone who can read this writing on the wall and tell me what it means will be famous and rich. He'll be given a purple robe, a great gold chain, and he will be third in command in the kingdom. Okay, so why third in the command instead of second? Well, because he's actually the prince sitting on the throne. His father's still alive. So the only, the closest position that he could offer to anybody who would interpret these words on the wall was slot number three, because... He was actually slot number two, but he was acting in slot number one. Does that make sense? So he was, he was like the vice president when the president was having surgery. <clears throat> Whatever. Anyways, so this sounds familiar, doesn't it? <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar did the same thing. When he wanted something to be, he wanted somebody to do something, he offered them the things that he found to be important. Riches, gold, silver, power, notoriety. Um, <clears throat> attention. Those are the things that he prized, and so that's what he thought everybody else would prize as well, and that's what he offered. Now, what I was encouraged to see was we didn't see from Belshazzar here any of the, we're going to tear people limb from limb like Nebuchadnezzar did, but, but still. So imagine that. This huge party is going on. This king, who thinks he's all that, drunk out of his mind, hooting and hollering, dancing, Probably not the greatest in behavior. 
And then he desecrates these vessels of God's and immediately <clears throat> a hand, a disembodied hand, just the hand, not the rest of the person, just a hand. And is described as a human looking hand. I believe the hand of Christ. A human looking hand starts carving on the wall letters and words. Can you imagine? I don't know if you ever went to a frat party. I think I may have gone to one in my life. It was not my thing, but if you've gone to any kind of a party where it's loud and raucous and people have had too much to drink and it's kind of a crazy free-for-all, can you imagine if something like this were to happen? Everybody, including the king, <gasps> because a disembodied hand carving in the wall is not something you see every day, is it? So the king was terrified. They said the blood ran out of his face. He couldn't control his arms or legs. He was wobbly. He was terrified. And, well, he should be. But the words that were written on the wall, nobody in the room understood. They knew they were words. They could see that they were being written like they were letters, but no one there understood them. Double terrifying. Some disembodied hand starts carving stuff in the wall, you think, mm, that's probably pretty important. But nobody could figure out what it was. So what does he do? Who does he go to to get an answer? He goes to the only source he knows, the wise guys. Now, why these people are still employed, I have no idea. So far, we have not heard that they've done anything useful, but yet somehow they all still have jobs. So anyways, he brings in whoever the wise guys were at this time. Now, we're probably estimates that Daniel at this point would have been about 85 years old. He apparently wasn't really in favor with this particular king. He didn't have the relationship with Belshazzar that he had with Nebuchadnezzar. And he obviously wasn't at the party. And when they called him the wise guys, he didn't come. So we don't really know what his role was. He was still... He was still an exile, a Judean exile, so he was still in the service of the king, but it doesn't seem like they had the relationship that he had with King Neb. So anyways, Belshazzar calls in his wise guys. Now we're to verse 8, verse 8 and 9. One after another they tried, but could make no sense of it. They could neither read what was written nor interpret it to the king. So now the king was really frightened. All the blood drained from his face. The nobles were now in a full-out panic. I bet. So the people that he placed, that the king placed all of his eggs, the basket he put all his eggs in, all of his trust, all of his, these are the people who are going to help me, all my, all my advisors, they couldn't help him at all. And it's a reminder, again, that when you want to have an answer about something that's done by God, you better ask somebody who knows God, right? We don't get our advice on, if we want godly wisdom, we have to go to those who know God. That seems pretty straightforward and pretty simple. But yet, don't we oftentimes ignore that? Instead of being God being the first one that we go to, exactly, the not-so-wise guys, instead of God being the first one that we go to, oftentimes he's the second or third, we first go to our friends. And truth be told, I'm guilty of this as well, when we want to know if we should do something or not, our human tendency seems to be that we're going to go and ask those friends of ours that we think are going to agree with us. That's our own hubris, our own pride, our own sort of self-enlightened, we want to feed our own ego by saying, I think I should do this. I'm going to ask the people who I think are going to tell me to do what I think I want to do in the first place. And that's not what we're encouraged to do because people are fallible. Now, we want to ask, people who are willing to sit down and pray with us, who know the Word of God, who obviously know and have studied 
and our ha <clears throat> have a close relationship with God to know his heart, to help us when we need help making decisions. And I'm not saying that we are not supposed to ask people for help. I believe God has placed other believers in our lives to come alongside us for that very, for that very reason, one of the many reasons. We are placed here in community with one another. We're not supposed to be an island in and of ourselves where we do everything, we know everything. No, that's not how we're designed. God has designed us to be in community just like we are here in this group. So back to the story. So now the king, he's asked people, the only people that he knows to ask hard questions and they don't have a clue. The not so wise guys as Jim and Apple don't call them. And so what does he do? Well, he doesn't know what to do. Thankfully, there's a queen in the palace. We don't know whose queen she was. We don't know if this queen was his mother or his grandmother or what. But there was a queen in the palace at this point in time who remembered Daniel. Not only remembered Daniel, but remembered what he had done for King Neb. She recalled, now we're down to verse, verse 10. The queen heard of the hysteria among the king and his nobles, and she came to the banquet hall. She said, long live the king. Don't be upset. Don't sit around looking like ghosts. There is a man in your kingdom who is full of the divine Holy Spirit. During your father's and grandfather's time, he was well known for his intellectual brilliance and spiritual wisdom. He was so good that your father, grandfather, King Nebuchadnezzar, made him the head of all the magicians, enchanters, fortune tellers, and diviners. There was no one quite like him. He could do anything, interpret dreams, solve mysteries, explain puzzles. His name is Daniel, but he was renamed Belteshazzar by the king. Have Daniel called in. He'll tell you what's going on here. I want to put a pause in for a moment, and I keep saying whenever the Bible, whenever the verse says, your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, I keep interjecting grandfather. For the longest time, there were no historical documents or writings that said anything about this dude, King Belshazzar. So the naysayers who don't believe that the Bible is truth said, Here's another reason that the book of Daniel is a bunch of hooey, because he mentions this King Belshazzar, and we don't have any record of King Belshazzar. Let me look up the name of the guy who they had a record of. Hang on. I had it in my head, and then it just went, shoop. So Belshazzar's father, what was the dude's name? Oh, for crying out loud. What was his name? Well, anyways, whatever the dude's name was, I'll find it and tell you about it later because I should have highlighted it. If anybody knows it off the top of their head, feel free to post it in the chat. Oh, Nabonius. Nabonius, nice name, was King Belshazzar's father. So Nabonius was actually the king, and there were plenty of writings that of Nabonius being the king. And it wasn't until 1854 that two artifacts were discovered. I forget what it was called, something of Nabonius. The, what was it? I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on one. But these two, these two um, artifacts were discovered, writings, and in them they mentioned that King Nabonius was praying to some moon god about leaving his son, his eldest son, Belshazzar, King Belshazzar, in charge while he went off to do some errand. So he wasn't, the real king wasn't even around. But this didn't come to light until 1854. When that archaeological find was made, it reinforced the validity, once again, of the book of Daniel. Now the naysayers, Daniel is one of the most targeted books of the Bible because it has so much prophecy in it. People tried to say, oh, Daniel didn't really prophesy about things and then it became true. He wrote about things that had already happened because it was written way later. Well, no. He wrote about things as they happened. And the fact that he knew Belshazzar and wrote about Belshazzar reinforces the fact that he was there and this really 
this is what happened. Okay, so anyways, so the queen says, go get Daniel. He's the dude who can help you. So Daniel, now we're to verse 13. So Daniel was called in. The king asked him, are you the Daniel who was one of the Jewish exiles my father brought here from Judah? I've heard about you, that you're full of the Holy Spirit. You've got a brilliant mind, that you're incredibly wise. Well, the wise men and enchanters were brought in here to read this writing on the wall and interpret it for me. They couldn't figure it out. Not a word, not a syllable. But I've heard that you interpret dreams and solve mysteries. So if you can read the writing and interpret it for me, you'll be rich and famous. A purple robe, a great gold chain around your neck, and third in command in the kingdom. Daniel answered the king, You can keep your gifts or give them to someone else. He didn't want the praise. He didn't want the honor. He didn't want the stuff. But I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. Listen, O king, verse 18. The high God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar a great kingdom and a glorious reputation. Because God made him so famous, people from everywhere, whatever their race, color, or creed, were totally intimidated by him. He killed or spared people on a whim. He promoted or humiliated people capriciously. He developed a big head and a hard spirit. Then God knocked him off his high horse and stripped him of his fame. He was thrown out of human company, lost his mind, and lived like a wild animal. We read about that in chapter 4. He ate grass like an ox and was soaked in heaven's dew until he learned his lesson that the high God rules human kingdoms and puts anyone he wants in charge. You are his son, his ancestor, and have known all this, yet you are as arrogant as he ever was. Look at you, setting yourself up in competition against the master of heaven. You had the sacred chalices from his temple brought into your drunken party so that you and your nobles and your wives and your concubines could drink from them. You used the sacred chalices to toast your gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, blind, deaf, and imbecile gods. But you treat with contempt the living God who holds your entire life from birth to death in his hand. God sent the hand that wrote on the wall, and this is what is written. Mene, Mene, Tekil, Tekil, and Perez. Sorry about the pronunciation. This is what these words mean. Mene, Mene, God has numbered the days of your rule, and they don't add up. They're over. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting, or weighed on the scales, and you don't weigh very much. You're not all that, in other words. <clears throat> and Perez, your kingdom has been divided up and handed over to the Medes and the Persians. So while this party was going on, the city of Babylon had these huge walls erected around it. So the people of Babylon, the king in particular, felt arrogantly safe. It was said that they had 20 years worth of provisions stored up inside those walls and felt like they could withstand any siege from any foe and they would never be conquered. Conquered, So their hubris went beyond hubris. Unbeknownst to them, while they should have been out guarding their walls, they didn't have a party, one section of this wall, the river Euphrates, ran under it. So the wall didn't go all the way down to the, <clears throat> to the floor of the river, obviously. But the river Euphrates was a pretty powerful river. But the Medes and the Persians were very clever. They had been laying siege outside the walls of Babylon while this party was going on. And they were clever enough to divert, I'm, I'm envisioning they built some sort of a dam to hold back the waters of the Euphrates or divert it so they could then go underneath the wall. And they had immediate and easy access to the city of Babylon so they could plunder it. And the king had no clue. He thought he was safe. How many other people think that they're safe? They think, well, yeah, there's a God, and yeah, I'm a sinner, but I have time. I'll do, I'll do what I want as long as I want, and then I'll, you know, maybe I'll come to God at the last moment. But we don't know when that last moment is. We each have an expiration date, and none of us knows when it is. King Belshazzar <clears throat> had no clue that he was about to be overthrown. However, 
comma, Daniel did what he was asked. And the king honored his commitment. Belshazzar did what he had promised. He put a gold chain around Daniel's neck and he clothed him in purple. I think this is the most I have. Just as he had promised. Now, purple is a color of um, honor and the color of royalty. <clears throat> so Belshazzar, verse 29, Belshazzar did what he had promised. He robed Daniel in purple, draped a great gold chain around his neck, and promoted him to third in charge in the kingdom. That same night, the Babylonian king, Belshazzar, was murdered. Darius the Mede was 62 years old when he succeeded him as king. I'm reminded again of that verse that we read in Proverbs 16, 18. Pride comes before the fall. Belshazzar thought he had it all figured out. I have walls of protection around me. I have supplies. I have wives. I have concubines. I have all the wine I could drink. And I have these nifty gold and silver chalices that prove that I'm better than these Judeans because we conquered them and they're under our rule. And God said, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Truth be told, every single one of us, were we to be weighed in the balance of God's perfection, we are all missing the mark. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Our only salvation is from Christ. Christ is the only one who could pay the price that we owed, and we must acknowledge, accept, that we cannot earn our way <clears throat> into God's favor. Believe that Jesus is the one who gave his life to provide the final sacrifice for us all. And not only did he die in our place and pay the price for our sins, but he rose again from the dead to prove that he conquered death. And then the C, is the ABCs of salvation, the C, commit then to following Christ and to serving him with our time and our talents and our treasures. So the challenge to you this week, it's almost, we're almost out of time, but I'm way too hot in this scarf. Sorry. The challenge to us this week is, how are we going to serve God with the time that we have? We don't know how much time that is. But as the song says, if you're living, if you're breathing, you're not done yet. That's true for every single person on this call, every person who watches this ever from now until eternity, until the Lord comes, that is. We have an appointment with death. We don't like to think about it, don't like to talk about it. But when that day comes, we are going to live forever. Every single one of us was created as an eternal being. Now our bodies, because of the fall, our bodies are not created as eternal things. So our bodies decay. That's why when we get old, we get cranky and creaky and hurt and ain't. We get sick and illness. Anyways, but our spirits will live on. And the choice that we have is where will we live on? Either in heaven with the Lord or in eternal damnation without him. I hope that if you have not yet made that decision, to accept the fact that you cannot earn your way into heaven, no ifs, ands, or buts, that the only way to get there is by accepting the fact that Jesus paid the price for your sin and mine, and he conquered death by raising from the dead, and that he's coming again. Lord, I pray that it be soon. Father God, thank you for this time that we had together, for your word that you've shared to us through this book of um, Daniel, and particularly chapter 5 tonight. Thank you that you are a just God. Because of that sense of justice, and because combined with your love, you provided a way for us to escape your wrath. We are all sinners and we all deserve punishment, but you provided the only way for us to be with you forever. Lord, if there's anyone listening to this message that has not yet come to that place in their heart, in their mind, in their spirit, that they know beyond the shadow of a doubt that they belong to you. I just ask that you would prick their heart tonight, that you would speak to their spirit, 
and encourage them and draw them to you so that we can be together forever with you in heaven. Lord, go with each one here tonight that's in this group, both those who are watching the call live and the people who are going to watch later, either here on Facebook or on YouTube, wherever, just ask that you would encourage their hearts, give them peaceful rest, and guide them as they walk the rest of their days, however many they may be, that we would choose to honor you. And we thank you for all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Jesus paid it all. Yes, he did. Thank you. I hope you all have a great week ahead and that you will be here again next week as we move ahead into Daniel chapter 6. That's all for tonight. Take care and God bless. Thanks again.